All right. Hey, we are, we're back on uh, our immune system conversation and we left the day with, I'm talking about this and our immune system response where we see our, our primary response. Then that second time we see a, a pathogen, your body's response. And we left with the question of, okay, is there a way to skip this primary response? This primary response isn't fun. That's where I'm, I'm sick for several days. Maybe I'm hospitalized. Maybe it's life-threatening. Maybe I don't Maybe as a as a human being, I'm not healthy enough to make it past that first response. Um, that's kind of a, the the gamble we run. If I do make it past, I'm good, but I might not make it past that primary response. So, is there a way that we can skip that and go directly to um, the secondary response with what we know about the biological world? Uh, the answer is yes, we can. With the advent of a couple of major breakthroughs in science, the two that we're going to talk about today are antibiotics and vaccinations, all right? So um, two things that have enabled us to um, live longer collectively as, as a species. Uh, death rates have plummeted since the advent of these two um, medical technologies here. So starting with antibiotics first, this is what you're reading is about today. Um, discovered in 1928 by Alexander Fleming. This is actually, I, I like this discovery a lot. It gives me hope as a scientist. Uh, I'm kind of a messy person. Um, so is he. Okay, he is a messy person. Um, if you look at him here, he's, you know, looks kind of like a grumpy guy in his lab, but I guess how they um, took pictures back in the day. But he has all these Petri dishes, all right, that he had was running experiments with with bacteria, and he'd actually just kind of left them. He'd kind of forgotten they were there, and he um, left them laying around. And his lab assistant noticed that there is a mold growing on some of the dishes, and that mold was killing off the bacteria that was living there. In, and, you know, enter the invention of penicillin. That was the first um, antibiotic, and that was the derivative of that mold um, chemical that is capable of, of killing bacteria. And how it does it is it attacks the cell walls of that bacteria. All right, now my question to you is, how is it, if it's a toxin, that's what an antibiotic means, it's anti-life, why doesn't it dissolve your cell walls as a person? Why can we take the pill or the several pills and wipe out the bacteria in our um, body, but leave our cells untouched? The answer to that is you don't have cell walls. Remember, we're just cell membranes. And so here we have a drug, a chemical that can kill, that dissolves cell walls. But we don't have cell walls, so it's perfectly fine for us as a species. All right. A um, couple of things about penicillin is it was, uh, he actually kind of struggled a little bit to isolate it correctly. But um, with World War II around the corner, they quickly figured out how to do that. Um, the issue with penicillin was it was toted as a miracle drug at the time. So they handed out penicillin to everybody. All right. They handed it out to everybody for every disease, whatever. Just Take as much, you know, as much penicillin as you can. The issue with that is we know bacteria are evolving. All right. Um, so that last bullet point, we discover relatively few truly new types of bacteria every year. Why do we have new methods for antibiotics? Because bacteria are evolving. If you've been on um, antibiotics recently, you probably got something from the doctor and it said, hey, you need to take this over the next 10 days and you need to take the whole thing. What happened? Why is that? All right. You feel better after one day. Why do you need to keep taking this thing for the next nine days if you're if you're cured and ready to go after one? Well, after one day, you've knocked out the majority of the bacteria. Okay. It is the majority's gone. Your immune system's gonna turn the corner on it and all that stuff. But what bacteria did you leave? You left behind the toughest bacteria. So you you maybe you took the 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 first couple of days of medicine, you wiped out 95% of the bacteria. Great. Well, what'd you do? You wiped out the weakest 95% of the bacteria. That last 5% was the most resistant. If you do that once, not a big deal. If you do that for generations, for decades of leaving only the strongest 5% left, that 5% is going to keep becoming stronger and stronger because we're using artificial selection to essentially build superbugs, all right? With that with excessive antibiotic use, um, we're just creating 
extreme bacteria that are resistant to a lot of things. So a couple comment uh, comics here to get you going for the day. Uh, here's kind of this shady looking bacteria that's going to give some DNA to this innocent looking bacteria. It says, Psst, hey, kid, want to be a super bug? Stick some of this in your genome and even penicillin won't be able to harm you. I like this because remember, bacteria can do conjugation. They can share genes back and forth with each other. They can share antibiotic resistant genes back and forth through each other as well. All right. So that is a huge deal. All right. That they're able to do that. And so nowadays we're a lot smarter in how we handle our um, antibiotics. We only give it when we're certain that they are going to be effective and we we're very stringent on how much you need to use. On the right, there is a bacteria. It looks like he's dying. He says, no, no, hold on. You, you're, um, you're, the human didn't take their full course of antibiotics, and we shall rise again, looking kind of angry there. So once again, if you do not take all your antibiotics, you're leaving behind the strongest bacteria. And so it's important that we take the full dose, that we don't overprescribe them, all that stuff in there. So that's our best weapon against bacteria. Extremely effective, okay? And it, within Within reason, if you get to a hospital in time, and you get antibiotics in your system, you're going to be feeling better almost, almost you know, 24 hours later with a lot of bacteria stuff. Viruses are a little bit different, all right? A little, sorry, a little PG-13, a little violence today. We got Batman slapping Robin, and he says, I think I need antibiotics for my cult, and that's Batman saying it's a virus. He's about to say cold. So we know that the common cold is caused by a virus. And what will antibiotics do to a virus? Absolutely nothing. Okay, viruses aren't alive, right? How do you kill something that's not alive? Well, the solution is we try to skip that first phase in your immune response. So our best tool against viruses are vaccinations. Okay, so what is a vaccine? All right, a vaccine, these are things that we've had around for, whoa, wow, the first like vaccination process is over 100 years ago. But what they are is they take a killed or weaken part of a virus. Typically, it's a virus, can be other pathogen like tetanus, um, and then they stimulate your immune system to react to that. So essentially, they're kind of giving your immune system like a scouting report. They're like saying, "Hey, we're going to give you like this dead, um, there this fried out, you know, smallpox virus. We're going to inject it, and your immune system is going to see it and be like, oh, hey, this, okay, well, let's build some memory cells so we're ready for this.'" Then when you come into contact with smallpox, you don't actually get sick from it. Okay. So that is, that is how vaccinations work. They've been, there is an interesting video about the first one was a smallpox vaccine um, from the, maybe unethical how they figured that one out, um, but from about a hundred years ago and so effective that smallpox no longer exists on earth. Um, here's a look at a um, Jonas Salk who, Pat, who came up with the polio vaccine in the 1950s. Polio was a disease that was crippling children. It was a really scary thing. Um, do we have polio anymore? We do not, thanks to the work of Jonas Salk and his um, vaccine. Also a good reminder on how morality works there. Um, he was a, you know, a good guy that just wanted to heal people, and so he wasn't worried about making $7 billion. He wanted to make sure that everyone had access to his vaccine he came out with. So how does it work? If we look at the United States from 100 years ago to the United States from 10 years ago, the sizes of those circles are how prevalent some of these major diseases were, okay? You look at measles, mumps, rubella, pertussis, diphtheria, smallpox, polio, all these things. And then what they were in 2000 or 2010, keep in mind, 2010, there were far more people in the United States than there were in the 1900s. But these are diseases that we don't really have to worry about anymore. Um, there are some, you know, there are still some um, disease in young people, but you go to any cemetery and you look at um, graves from over 100 years ago, you're going to see a huge number of children, child graves, right? A huge number of children didn't make it out of childhood because of these deadly viruses and bacteria. Thanks to, uh, thanks, thanks to modern um, additions to different things, then we have new ways to fight as we're going forward. So there's a little bit about some recent advance, advances. And we'll call that good for the day.